everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Richard Listens Show. I'm Richard Olberger, clinical psychologist and your podcast host. And thank you to our sponsors, Impact Dental Designs. For anyone who watched the MMA fights this weekend with Lyman Good and Shane Burgess, they were tremendous. And they are wearing custom-made Impact Dental Designs for the MMA fighter or also for you or I, if you're going out playing soccer, football, boxing, or MMA, protect your mouth, do it in a custom, cool way, or for those football players out there or any way that you want to keep your mouth protected, uh, Impact Dental Designs. Check them out on Instagram uh, or online. Anyway, today I'm excited to bring to you, um, it's really humbling when my childhood, when I get to meet people who've just gone on to become amazing performers in their own right. Today we have, uh, although I like to think of him as my childhood basketball buddy and teammate through varsity basketball, he has gone on to follow the beat of his own drum to become a uh, jazz musician. And, um, He is one of the mere handful of improvisers who can play the bass clarinet exclusively. He leads his acclaimed trio, Locksmith Isidore, as well as his own quartet. He's uh, contributed to several leading bands on the Chicago music scene, and he's brought a vital voice to the freest of free jazz shows. His music manifestation range from 1920s style of Jimmy McPartland through the tenor titans of the 1950s, through the adventurers who performed AACM in the 60s, and right up through the city's renowned modern cadre of new music improvisers. Stein has lived in Chicago since 2005. He's played uh, abroad, uh, played in stadiums across the US, and he has released records on albums, uh, labels such as Leo, Delmark, Not Too, Atavistic, 482 Music, Clean Feed, Astral Spirits, Sunnyside, Ears and Eyes, and The Northern Spy. Um, I'm excited just because he is passionate and he is a dreamer. And so I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I will. Thank you, everybody. It's been a long time coming, my friend. <laughs> It's true. It's true. I've been looking for many, many months. Many I have to tell you that I was called out yesterday for my purchase of strength shoes in basketball. Oh, really? And I have to confess that uh, it was it was because you had them and you were you were very good at jumping. Wait, you were you mean you got them because of that, or you were called out because of that? No, I think my mom called me out for purchasing them and not utilizing them enough. So. Oh, I understand. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> the, the jumping shoes were, they were a controversial item, even, even back, back in middle school. I mean, did they cause some injuries? I wonder what, I wonder what happened with those. I, don't, I, I do not think they caused injuries. I think that they are officially safe. Uh, I think it was just more controversial whether they actually did anything at all. What they said, yeah. Nowadays, <laughs> there'd be like, you know, Facebook comments and an Instagram page debunking oh, them. But but back then, it was like an urban legend. Like, you bought them and, like, either you were too ashamed to say they didn't work. <laughs> yep. It, it totally was an urban legend. But also, if you did the drills that the, that the instruction manual that came with the shoes recommended, the drills themselves were really hard and really good. You could have done them without the shoes, and they would have been super beneficial. Yeah, exactly. They made you. They made you really focus on um, building the calf muscle, right? Oh yeah, totally. Doing a, a bunch of stuff with your just your legs and cardiovascular like exercise kind of stuff. Yeah, it was amazing. The, the shoes themselves were incidental. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a true honor. I mean, you, you know, having been someone who shared many of my favorite basketball journeys, uh, most of that will finally make it into a book this year. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, there'll be a whole section on uh, choosing your village in terms of what, what raises you up and, and the difference in the two basketball teams that we were a part of. I know we're going to get into, uh, you know, your, your passion and focus in life. I don't deny your music career. I just please, I, no, no. I, I love your basketball memories. And uh, and I want to cover how I, I mean, a lot of high performers do par- parlay their passion in one area mm-hmm. into another area. Yeah, um, I can 
yeah so we we played on these two different teams and one was like really fun and really loving and and we did really well and the other one was like kind of harsh and kind of fierce infighting <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and so i'm trying to like make sense of this i know how i was impacted um mm -hmm. but how you know the different styles of, of of cultures of teams and and how players can thrive in different environments um what have you taken away from from those experiences growing up and uh what do you remember the most well i i should say i mean my I have a lot of thoughts and feelings about basketball. I tend to not organize them around specific teams that I was on. So it's like, I, I, I don't really think that much specifically about like, really like that, like the differentiation between like what came from what you're talking about. Like the, we were, I, we were on the Jewish junior Olympic team together. The, the map the copy. Games. Yeah, totally. Uh, we, we won the bronze medal. Very controversial. Baltimore. Thought we should have taken See, the gold. <laughs> there's no doubt we should have taken the gold. We in the in the game that would have taken us to the gold, we were annihilating Suffolk. And then mm -hmm. we just collapsed. And it and it, it it felt like it was such a collapse, it had to have been psychological. There's no way that it was just a physical collapse. It was crazy. We were winning by a lot and then we lost. But that aside, and then the other team was our, our high school team, which we played on for a number of years. Um, which yes. I wound, I eventually wound up quitting because of my relationship with basketball, and the, uh, I mean the Maccabee games. The the coach the coach was very warm, very sweet, very inclusive, um, and there was definitely like a feeling of camaraderie, just in the culture of the team and a sense of friendliness amongst the players. Very minimal internal competition in the Maccabee game team. And so it was, the, the, there was like a, a feeling of like, you were, you were really playing on a, on a team. There, the, the team aspect, aspect of it was, was highlighted. The high school team uh, was super integrated with like people's personal uh, senses of accomplishment and what they wanted themselves to get out of it. High school sports also in the in that kind of context. I think unless the coach really pushes back against it, they're so integrated with like popularity and wanting to, to be sort of successful, just as like a dude in high school, regardless of like the team itself. And so there was there, there were a lot more dynamics that that mattered. The Mackenzie games also were they were like a detached universe that had nothing to do with our our high school world. No one that we knew. Yeah, it's like playing with house money, right? It's yeah, totally. I mean, it was it it, it was like a, it was a very safe, isolated environment. We we played for Riverdale, this community in the Bronx. Um, whereas the high school team, it was it was this one part of a much larger world where everything was integrated and, and kind of like flowing in and out seamlessly from like one thing to another. Very different. See, even the way you describe basketball now, it, it makes me th like think of music. So, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprised. I mean, there, there's I I have drawn all kinds of interconnections between my experience of basketball and music, like from the microcosmic to the macrocosmic. It, it, it's like there's a lot of things that that, that come from one and then the other. Now you you were a prolific reader, um, at some point a writer, mm -hmm. um, and you decided to leave basketball uh, as a junior or senior year, senior year, senior year. Yeah. Yeah. Now that that's a really hard decision for, for a high school athlete, let alone, I, I saw some of the letters that you received. Uh, one is getting attention. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I wonder if you could speak to that, your journey and for other people out there who, right. Who just have followed sports because parent pressure or just it's what your town says is cool. Right and that have other intuitions rising inside of them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for me, my basketball career was um, basically spanned from when I was in fifth grade until 12th grade. And I was really tall and I was relatively coordinated. And as a fifth grader, I could get rebounds, put the ball back in, 
and I destroyed anyone my own age. Because partly because I was tall and I, I could move my body somewhat well. So I was like, I, I, I had some, some capabilities. And then that kind of developed into by the time I was in eighth grade, I got moved up to play for the high school, which had never happened before. And so it was kind of a big deal. And I felt a little bit like, I felt a lot like I, I, I got kind of a fair amount of attention for it. And it was like, I, I had this like strong identity as like a successful basketball player. And it was partly based on the sense of expectation for what the future was going to hold for me. And, and also based on what I could actually do at the time. Um, but right from the start, once I got moved up and I was playing with older kids who were more my size, stronger than me, faster than me, it was really hard for me to adapt to the game. It was like I was I was better than most of the kids who were my own age, but then when I played with older kids, with the kind of game that comes along with playing like junior varsity sports, I, I didn't really get it. It was it was faster than I could kind of like take in and I didn't know how to adapt. And that never really changed. Like starting from when I was in eighth grade, I was still pretty good. But then by the time I was like a junior, a sophomore or junior, I just, I, I, I wasn't really that strong of a player anymore in the context of like what the actual games were, what like the scoring I was able to do, the rebounding I was able to do, the impact I was able to have on the game. I was still uh, more defined by like this sense of potentiality than what I was actually doing. And I think I was really aware of that probably earlier than other people were. And so then there was this huge disparity between like my identity and I'm like this basketball superstar. And when you have that kind of identity, it's not necessarily based on what you're actually doing. Like people just knew me as that. They weren't thinking of that in terms of the game that I had played two days ago. And it was, it created a lot of tension in me because I wasn't living up to the expectations that I was seeing right in front of my eyes on a daily basis. It was like I'd go to the deli and the parent of a kid in school would see me at the deli and he'd know who I was and he'd be like, oh, we're, you know, you're, you have such great things to look forward to. You're doing this or doing that. And I know that they weren't actually seeing what I was doing. They just knew who I was. And it, it was, it was really stressful. Um, I'm like a pretty honest person and I did not like getting attention for accolades that I knew I didn't deserve. And it, it, it wasn't me being overly humble. I was 16, you know, I was, I was just based on facts. And, uh, and so then for like a year or two, basketball was just defined by stress to me. It was just like me having to kind of like slowly watch myself not live up to expectations. Um, and then I, by the time I was 17, I was like, wait, I can actually choose to not have to deal with this. And it was not worth it even a little bit. I was so excited to quit. I was so happy to not play anymore. Uh, it, basketball like did absolutely nothing for me aside from negative things so had you it, found uh, another passion first or was it just a recognition that this does not feel good no it was it i it, it was not for the sake of anything else it was it was just like really not be able to deal anymore with, with what was going on and i mean really my entire world uh i mean it fell apart to a large extent around that because it was like basketball was this uh it was kind of the glue that held together my whole world it was like I did well in school because I wanted to go to college play basketball and blah, blah. it was it, it was it was really like a, a binding force in all these things and then once basketball got taken out of the picture uh it was probably also just personal things in my own like development and getting older and stuff and, and being who I was I was uh I, I just like almost overnight became like kind of a bad kid. Like I stopped going to school and I, I never did drugs. I didn't drink. Um, but I was like, I, I was no longer uh, a law abiding high school citizen. <laughs> you know, I was, I was, I was a rule breaker because I was just like, wait a minute. Like the system is something that I don't like. And I'm allowed to think that, you know, it, it was, it was a real awakening for me in both a negative way and a positive way. And then that, kind of things falling apart in putting them back together. I, I found a bunch of things that have kind of become like what my life is about. So who did you draw some support from at that time? I mean, when you're breaking from a system that like mm -hmm. defines everything, I mean, right. You, you didn't violate the, uh, the, the drinking and, and using drugs, which would like cast you outside. So it's kind of like, well, you right. You must, you must have caused the system to rethink itself. Did you find some unexpected support or, even mentors outside of 
like from from literary or, or musicians like where did you go well yeah I I, I think um, I think that I partly I mean it's 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 sort of messy you know like there's the there's, there's did no you just clean trust answer. yourself or did you just learn like this kind of self-reliance I, I I mean I spent a lot of time walking around the streets of our town late at night I I like just had a, a strong attraction to being outside walking around um, I think the um, there was a real draw to me it sounds sort of cliche, but like the, uh, the idea of like a freedom was really strong to me at that time. Uh, I, I mean, I, I got into reading like Jack Kerouac, those kinds of books, um, which are, that's basically at the heart of a lot of that literature is, is about freedom and about kind of like finding the balance between leaving certain things and discovering other things. And that, that was a really good fit for me at the time. I, I do think that I found some solace in that and some company in like reading stories of people who were like uh, in the, like in the spaces between, it, like inside of culture, like people that didn't have a job, people that you might call a bum was super appealing to me. I was like, I, oh, this is what I want to be. I want to be one of these guys. Like, and, and for no reason, there, there was no specific reason I was attracted to that, but it was it was kind of like my real nature. Um, but yeah, I mean, th it's there, very there romantic, no though. I really the beatnik generation. I mean, one of the books sure. right is on the road, and then Dharma bums, and um, mm -hmm. I'm finally three quarters of the way through town in the city, mm -hmm. and there's a scene where one of the sons, I think, is in a psychiatric ward, and his mm -hmm. son and his father travels a thousand miles to visit him. And even their discussion, the description about kind of the father being like trying to understand rationally why he strategically has placed himself in a psychiatric ward from the father's perspective. Like it's mm -hmm. yeah, really yeah. beautiful look, you know, perspective on the human condition and about mm -hmm. the ways people travel the country and, and just who you meet and where you go and what you see and very mm -hmm. vivid descriptiveness of, uh, of life. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, I sort of realized a few things. One, I, I, whether this is true or not, I had a really strong sense that uh, no one knows anything about anything. Like adults don't know things. I, I really remember thinking that when I was like 16, 17, 18 years old, like, like, wait a minute, no one knows anything. No one knows what I should do. Like people think you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. No one knows. You could do all these things that are considered really great and then it could wind up that you can't get a job because for whatever it's like no one knows anything and i would test that like I'd, I'd have conversations with adults a lot about things that i wanted to do that initially they'd be like you're crazy you can't do that and then after talking for a while i was i was pretty adept at changing people's minds um i really liked herman hess he I, it, in a way herman hess was more important to me than jack kerouac um, Narcissus and Goldman, books that were about like the uh, juxtaposition between like emotions and intellect were super important to me. And still to this day, like I think about that a lot. That also has a lot to do with music and the music that I play. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, I just kind of had the feeling like I have this life and like I have no idea what I want to do with it. I didn't care about college. I didn't care about money. I didn't care about a job. And it was like, I, you know, I was naive, but at the same time, it was like, I really didn't care about those things. Like not just being an idiot kid. I like really didn't care. And I wanted to figure out some way that I could do something that felt meaningful to me. I cared about that. So what was the, what was the first step? Was it, um, the, the trip cross country? Was it writing a manuscript? Like what, what started to build a little bit of well, trust I, that, that like you yeah. could you could you could back up your philosophy argument to yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> I mean, I got I got really lucky. Um, it's still somewhat of a mystery how this kind of worked out. But like I uh, once I quit basketball, 
early senior year, um, I had the plan to quit school. I had a pickup truck and I was going to live in my pickup truck and just be like, just kind of like say bye bye and not really know what the hell I was going to do. Um, I, my, my dad died when I was really young, so I didn't have a father telling me what I needed to do. And my relationship with my mom was such that um, there, there were really no authority figures in my life at all. Now being a parent, I, I would define that as in and of itself being a problem. Um, I was- Father's Day, by the way. I'm really proud to see you as a dad. Thank you, likewise. To, yeah. hmm. uh, to, today's actually my, would, what would be my dad's 72nd birthday. It's funny. Oh, wow. This is um, this is the day that that my dad passed last year, so that's pretty interesting. Oh really? Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So oh, yeah. we'll yeah. celebrate it together, hopefully, somewhere. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Do you, does it, do you think about him often? Um, I do. Yeah. I mean, especially having a child, I think about. Him. I mean, I've I've always thought about him a fair amount, but yeah, I I, I do. I think about him a lot. I'm just kind of aware of like. I don't know the sort of imagined idea of, of what it would be like to have a parent for my, you know, like for my daughter to have a grandpa. Um, I mean, he, he died when I was 10. And so it's like, and, and my parents got divorced when I was two. So I spent weekends at his house from when I was two to, to 10. So I, I wasn't really around him all that much. I didn't know him very well. Um, and it's, it's a complete mystery to me growing up with a father I, it's like I have absolutely no idea what it would be like at all and let alone the idea of being an adult and, and having a dad um, but but at that age um, whatever role like a stereotypical father would play I, I see a lot of times it would be to tell your son that he's being crazy and like calm the fuck down <laughs> that, that, that's just like it, there, there was no there, there was no person in my life who did that even remotely um, I tried to give you some quizzical looks, but that's the yeah, best no, I, I, do. I Well, I I got a lot of quizzical looks. There, but there it's was, the I, unknown. I, I, it's really the unknown. I mean, when you know, we create the security mm -hmm. of small towns and talk about privilege and and white privilege, and we try and create mm -hmm. this. And and you mentioned this idyllic walks in the evening of real serenity mm -hmm. and peace and safety great deal that that you would not be impacted by crime or harm uh and yet there's this flip mm -hmm. side of like the truman show of <laughs> is my life being kind of scripted and directed in a way and i know that mm -hmm. maybe there's bigger things out there totally but yeah i mean i think that for me my interest in just like being out like that was uh was Kind of like having a sense of adventure and sort of I, I hardly like testing it out in like what you're saying like a very safe environment where it's like there was no real threat in any way but also it was all it was like my only option I and I I would I don't know I I wanted a I, I, I don't know I, I just had a strong sense of adventure and 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 limit pushing I, I I really wanted to push limits but that so what wound up happening was the principal of, of our high school uh, came to me and offered me the option to do whatever I wanted, live in my car, skip my entire senior year, drive around the country. Uh, he, well, he, he asked me what I wanted to do. He was like, what, what are you thinking? And so I told him that was kind of my plan. Um, and, and I could graduate from doing it. It, I, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's nuts. Um, I, I, I kept a journal. I had a, mail my journal entries back to the high school and the poor secretary of my principal had to type my journal which is insane <laughs> um Send i read a, a card, lot of books <laughs> seriously uh and uh, yeah and i i mean for like five six months i i drove from new york down to florida across like through texas to california up california and then back across to the center of the country uh I, I slept in a hotel probably like once every two weeks or so. I slept, I, I had a mattress in the back of a pickup truck with a, like a cap on the back of the truck. I slept in there. Um, it was insane. I, I was 18 years old. You know, I, I didn't use an ATM card. I, 
the part of the reason I could do it was because since my dad did die when I was a kid, when I turned 18, I got uh, a small inheritance from him that was supposed to be used towards college. But again, there was no one in my life that was going to say, you have to use that for college. What's wrong with you? And so I just spent it to have time. Um, what a gift. And uh, yeah, I, I, it, it, it really, really was. It really was. I, I mean, I can see, like, there, there's people in my life who I think for a, a long time, even probably still, think of me as, like, um, uh, just, like, uh, irresponsible, lucky, dope, who spent a lot of money in a short amount of time that could have been put to a much better use. And that's true. I can totally understand that. But I, I can also see what that time gave to me and it, it really created like what became my entire life and so it's like it's so indispensable that i i feel really fortunate about it yeah and in the end but, it's what what we believe about our time and what we create with it i mean uh that mm -hmm. really matters and, and wanting to please everybody like getting over that hump early on i wonder how that's mm -hmm. kind of liberated you right because i mean it, it does you know i'm not an expert in jazz and certainly you didn't you're, you haven't taken the safest route with music either, right? I mean, you, you've chosen experimental jazz. I mean, I mean, it's it's never stopped, right? What you're pushing the envelope, so. For sure, I, I will I will say with jazz, there's not really a safe route. I mean, it's such an unpopular enterprise. You there, there's there's no, there's no parallel, you know, to like I'm going to be, you know, a doctor in jazz. You know, like the, 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 there's no safe way to do it where it's like, well, I. I I'm going to take this path because it's like going to be the most easily successful one. Uh, I mean, it, that's on that front. It's like, it's, it feels like a calling and, and it's like, it does. I mean, I don't know what I, what else I'd do if I didn't do that. And I also am super motivated by my relationship with the music and trying to do a lot of different things. And it's, it, that is a, I feel really lucky to have a relationship with something as an adult that's so engaging to me that I'm so interested in and put a lot of time and energy into um, that in terms of like tangible results has very little to offer. You know, it's, it's also like, it would be hard to make an argument for why a person should do that. It, it, it really just feels like a calling. Uh, but, but just for my own understanding and for our listening uh, listeners, I mean, you did invest, like there was, mm -hmm. there were music lessons early on. There was a commitment to practice. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you were very dedicated. And I remember that you would take yeah, yeah. your lessons were like an hour away. If I recall at one point when you were getting uh, into music yeah. a little bit more. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you were investing and committing. It wasn't like just, it's not all just dumb luck. Totally. Oh, no, no, for sure. I mean, I, 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 I worked really, I worked, I've worked very, very hard at music. I mean, I, I think amongst the chaos of my world when I was a teenager and then on after that, music was like the one thing that I had chosen to do completely on my own that wasn't defined by anybody feeling like I needed to do it or I had a responsibility to do it. I was pretty secretive about it at first when I started playing. I, I started playing guitar as a kid um because if it felt really precious to me it, it i my world felt so defined by other people's expectations and and what was being put upon me uh and music was kind of this uh this island that i could i could live in and feel pretty uh comfortable and free and then that just sort of grew into the whole landscape but yeah i mean i I practiced a lot. That that was the other thing that was that was a really good fit for me about music was like with basketball I had learned all these skills about practicing and commitment and and breaking it's like if you're like I want to be a good basketball player part of the skill set of doing that is being able to break it into smaller parts and then work on those smaller parts and assemble them into a game. Um you can't really be good at just one thing in basketball and expect for it to be uh, successful. And then even to put together all these different parts then to integrate them into actually playing a game, which is improvisational. That also takes a certain kind of mindset and a certain kind of clarity and work. Um, and it, it's exactly the same model with music. It's like you're, you can practice these different components of things that you have to put together to be able to play. 
and then you have to be able to actually do it in a setting where you're with jazz specifically where you're improvising and you're making stuff up using whatever tools you've been able to develop individually um and having a background in basketball was super helpful for assembling like a vocabulary and a relationship with with jazz music once i was interested in it yeah and and now when you when you look at your accomplishments i mean you're not only you know playing music you're you're organizing um you know you like you're you're organizing trios right you're bringing your are you producing the music i mean you're collaborating on the rolling out of the social media i mean th there's so many hats you seem to be you know um wearing and i i wonder if that kind of gives you pause that you've become like the social musician for someone who is like a very quiet internal basketball player <laughs> right 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 totally <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know i by like the career end of my musical world it is just kind of come together step by step you know I, I i tend to be someone that's like if i identify some task has to has to be fulfilled and it's clearly me that's going to be the one to do it then i'll do it you know I, I i i never like had a moment of like stepping back and thinking like what's my plan of attack here how am i going to do this or that and then do it's it's just more like things come up that seem obviously uh needing to be done and then and then i i do them i i tr i prefer to just kind of focus on the musical end of things um but yeah I, I, a lot comes along with that that sort of has to be done and i'm i'm more than happy to do that i uh for for quite a while i i booked my own tours i've traveled a, a lot throughout the world and played um these days with some of the bands that i play in the we have a booking agent that makes that end of things a lot easier but um i yeah i mean when when you're the kind of musician that i am it, it's like uh there's a lot of aspects of it that are very blue collar that are very like grindstoney you just kind of have to hammer stuff out and figure out how to get certain things done to work and you could sort of make the argument that a, a lot of the work that you do is you're working to enable future work that it's very process oriented. Um, and depending on your relationship with that kind of stuff, like I know a lot of people that think it's really thankless and it's frustrating and annoying. And then other people that are super happy about what comes up and you know what they're able to do within whatever confines exist. I really like playing. You know, I, I, I like learning things on my instrument. I play the bass clarinet, by the way. Um, I, I, I like, uh, the having the option to fold things from my life into this specific pursuit and to watch that pursuit develop um it's i find it really gratifying and for the listeners that are you know novice to the different instruments um there there are not there's only a handful of musicians that really play the bass clarinet exclusively yeah, the the bass clarinet is a funny instrument. It's like a, it's kind of like a cousin to the saxophone. To to look at it, it looks very similar to a saxophone. Um, but if you're a musician, and especially if you're a saxophone player, there's things that are built into the bass clarinet that are kind of uh, present certain challenges. That it's an instrument that really needs to be figured out to to work with in the in the like out in the world. Um, and it's it's a good fit for me, sort of because of that. It, like trying to hammer out and, and, and figure out different, different little challenges that are presented and, and, and make it work. So it sounds like you keep it fun. You keep it interesting. You're always learning. Um, yeah. But yeah, now that you're, you, you're like living this, it's professionalized, right? Where you're playing on the Chicago scene and you're traveling or at least prior to uh, our current yeah. quarantine, right? Traveling across the world. How do you, exude some of the things that athletes do like time management any kind of transitions and self-care how do you keep it all balanced yeah totally i i that's definitely a thing um for me i uh this also i i think is really similar to a lot of athletes it's like i i thrive uh within like self-imposed structure and the way that i feel the most free and loose is to cultivate structure within like really just like my day uh with touring um 
I just, I'll, I'll like, I'll, I tend to be able to find like a half hour here, an hour there where I can take my horn out and warm up and practice. Um, I have a certain breathing habits, uh, routines that I do in the morning that really help just kind of help, like, regardless of the environment that I'm in, what's going on, it, it makes my days feel like they're my days. It's like, uh, I think that I can do whether I'm home or, or out on the road. Um, but that, the, the, that idea of like creating structure is, uh, is really helpful to me. What's been the most surprising thing for you about like traveling the world and seeing different types of jazz or types of people that are interested in jazz? The most surprising thing? I mean, uh, I don't know that. It, or is playing just it, playing? It's, yeah. it's hard for me to say. I mean, I uh, I am a man that enjoys hotel rooms. I I tend to uh, I, I I tend to like if I have some time. I'm not I'm not the guy that's like going out and checking out this museum or restaurant or square or and I I I can understand thinking that it, I'm I'm wasting time or whatever. But I uh. I mean, maybe that's the most surprising thing is, is like if I'm in Helsinki or if I'm in Bloomington, Indiana, if I have an hour in the, that I can be in a hotel, I'm going to do it. Um, that's the, that's kind of my vibe. Well, it makes sense. You can control the space a little bit. I mean, when you spend so much time having to be on the road and around so many people trying mm -hmm. to create a little bit of space for one's own internal process, it sounds like it becomes really sacred. For sure, yeah. I mean, that that's something that I've I've learned about myself is I I, uh, I I do do a lot better when I have at least some alone time on a really on a daily basis, and that 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 comes up too sometimes where it's like I'm not a person who can like hang out really late and then go home and go right to sleep. Like I'll go home and be awake for hours a lot of time just because it's like I for my I don't know like my endocrine system to to work in an effective way. It's like I I, I need a certain amount of time to just like be with myself and. And quiet and like process I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a processor yeah is the process like um, directed towards music or is it like diffuse like you focus on other things and that helps the creative process it's I, I think it's different things at different times I, sometimes I might not even it's not even necessarily like a conscious thing of like okay I'm gonna I'm gonna think about this or I'm gonna work on processing that or whatever. It's just like giving my mind space to not have to talk to somebody, not have to be conscious of how I'm going about anything. And, so, and then it's like, I can just like wander, you know, like wandering is really important to me. And that's something else that I found. Like when I'm home, a lot of times at midnight or one in the morning, everybody goes to sleep and I go out and, and walk around and I'm literally wandering. I'm not going to go anywhere. Uh, but that process, that feeling of like um, just kind of having an open sense of space really helps me. And when I'm traveling, my version of wandering is being in a hotel room by myself because it's like I, I can just kind of do that. My, my friend Michael Zarang one time, a long time ago, said, he, he said to me, he was like, you know, a lot of people don't understand that a lot of artists just need to be able to sit and stare at the wall. And that seems so entitled and, and just like, are you kidding me? Like, how can you say that that's something that's important to you? Um, but, but he was like, and he, he, he's considerably older than me, especially at the time, he, he seemed like a lot older than me. Um, but I really identify with that. I, I think there's a lot to be said for that. It, it's like, it is important sometimes to just not have anything that you need to do. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the gifts uh, I may have shared with you, uh, you know, the, that early on in this quarantine, you know, I'm not sure if it was the coronavirus, but I definitely had uh, fevers. And uh, along with that came like total loss of coordination. And I wound up with like a sprained ankle and like a bruised elbow oh, that wow. I couldn't move. Yeah. And so like all of a sudden I could barely move. And so the gift though was that like I could just make it outside my bedroom door and sit 
in my backyard, mm -hmm. which I, mm -hmm. you know, spend quite a bit of time. Like I put a fountain for my father. I put a hummingbird mm -hmm. feeder. I had planted mm -hmm. seeds for a certain uh, flower that draws butterflies. So the gift of sitting Very still, nice. you know, was like, it was profound because when you're still and you cannot move, uh, and if you could get to a place of acceptance around it, rather than, you know, mm -hmm. really fighting it, there is so much learning and presence that comes to you. And one of the things I could do was, was record and talk to people. So it became this amazing opportunity of like, you know, wow, well, this is where I've been wanting to be. First of all, it's like gratitude yeah. for where you are. And, and saying like, like when you have appreciation for everything that's around you and how fill, a full life is uh, and all the little intricate movements from the swaying of the trees to um you know the the wind gusting so it's 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 really something that fills you up and the way you go about your your creativity when you feel full mm -hmm. is very different uh than when it's like this need to perform this need to produce for sure. an outcome for sure yeah yeah totally yeah totally I mean, I wanted to ask you, I didn't want to, you know, escape the, uh, you know, the topics of the day. I mean, for you, so when we're talking about this freedom, this ability to wander and space being so important for you and creativity, uh, how are you doing? I mean, you've been quarantined, uh, you know, I'm sure it's amazing to be home and, and to be a dad. Um, and we've had, I see the, the Black Lives Matter poster, you know, we, we've been surrounded. You're in Chicago, um, certainly plenty of activity there so how's it been for you in terms of filling space and feeling connected to and yet there's so much going on around you totally I mean I would say it's like it's almost like I would say, I would say two things one it's like eh, whatever it's not that bad and two it's like man it sucks <laughs> and I I, I I I think both those things I don't know it's like I uh I you guys mean, had to cancel a tour. Oh yeah, I mean, I've yeah. I've had all like just a boatload of stuff canceled, and that that it that was kind of initially it was like, it's been a process. I mean, in March, there was kind of a moment when, after reading a few articles, I realized what was coming, what seemed likely to happen, maybe like a week or so before. Uh, the, the reality of the situation more like kind of descended on the whole country, travel bans and, and all, all that kind of stuff and, and people really having to shelter in place. Um, and yeah, tours got canceled. Uh, at that point, it was like tours in March, April, May got canceled. And then since then, pretty much for the rest of the year, it's like everything is, is canceled at this point. Um, I think the next official tour that I have is in January of next year. Um, and I mean, I've, I've just tried to adapt, you know, to just kind of go with what it is. I mean, I'm lucky that I can still practice at home and, and feel pretty satisfied with doing that. I mean, I, I, I practice all the time anyway, it's something I like to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly a huge, uh, inconvenience, but then it's like, I I don't know. I try and keep in perspective, you know, like how, like how comfortable I am with being inconvenienced and I, it's all right. You know, I, I mean, I, I do certainly like being home. I, 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 I have a six year old little daughter and it's amazing to spend so much time with her. I, I, I spend a lot of time with her anyway. One of the nice things about being a touring musician and not having another job is when I'm home, I'm really home. Um, and even though I tour a lot, it's like, I, I'm still home more than I'm on tour. Um, but yeah, I mean it's it's a it's it's a crazy crazy minute. You know, I, I've I've spent really a lot of time just trying to wrap my head around like how uh, mind numbing and you know confusing the whole situation is. I mean, it's it's not something that really ever happens. I read a really interesting article like early on in March that was about the idea of uh, being a base rater or a growther. Are, are you familiar with those no. uh, kind of classification? It's really interesting to me. It was like, uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm probably not going to do it justice, what what that stuff means, but base rater, like B-A-S-E dash rater, R-A-T-E-R. 
um, versus a growther. And the the idea was like a base rater is what most of us are most of the time. The idea that like you're sort of using your empirical experience of the world to determine what's likely to happen or not happen. In terms of a virus like this, it's like at the end of February when maybe you were seeing a little bit, ah, this is going on in China, blah, blah, a little, maybe this is a little bit going on in Italy, but your sense is like, come on, like there's never a global pandemic that's gonna make it so I can't go to work even for two days, let alone longer. My kids, of course, they're going to be able to keep going to school. You know, like it, you're, what never happens, never happens because it never happens. That's like being right. a, 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 a base raider, you know, and it comes up all the time. It's like the sky is never falling ever. You know, you understand that sometimes bad things happen, but they don't happen to me really, because that's just how the world normally works on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I, I, I also think that part of the way that we just deal, whether it's conscious or unconsciously with risk is by being this thing being called the base raider. It's like you you have to be able to deal with the idea that like you get in your car and you drive to the deli, you're not going to get mowed down by another car, you know? Because yeah, yeah. you're not. You need to have a healthy denial of risk. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And a growther is someone who lives in data, who more processes reality by understanding data. And so like in this situation if in February you were just looking at data, you were looking at what's going on in China, what's going on in Italy, what is slowly trickling to the United States, there were a lot of people who were data scientists who 100% knew what the situation was gonna be like here two months later, and that it was gonna be more of like a sky falling type situation that's highly unusual. Um, and it seems like for the most part, growthers are usually the people that were like, ah, all right, you're talking all this crazy shit, that's not what's gonna happen. Uh, and and this time, it was like the growther perspective was really spot on, and that it's that's so unusual. And then to like what it also does, at least for me, is is it makes me think like, well, damn, like what are the other situations where it's going to go down like this? You know, like it 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 kind of makes it like, um, it opens the door to to what feels like more of a possibility of things that seem super unexpected to happen to actually happen. Yeah, and and the and the beauty behind that is that the super unexpected can also be really powerful and profound, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's kind of like, sure. well, what happens when everybody, right? People started to post like nature started to look like in L.A. The air, the air quality was yeah, the yeah. best in L.A. Totally. Uh, the 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 capacity, and it's really hard. Like when you're trying to see someone to communicate, and you're like, oh, I can't see the mouth behind the mask. How you mm -hmm. have to really communicate with your eyes. Mm -hmm. it, like so much yeah, yeah. has to go into the intentionality uh, and now the power of uh, technology where uh, I think you and I have had more conversations in the last three months than probably since we were probably mm -hmm. 16, 17 years old, you know, or close totally, to it. Totally, so, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I, I, you know, I hope that there's more of that going along and not just pure entropy. Uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, Armageddon and zombie apocalypse is in our future. <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, how, how the next like six to eight months play out is, is a great curiosity to me. You know, I, I really feel like the range of, of what might happen is, is pretty wide. I'm how do you idea. stay, how do you stay in possibility and curiosity and open space when there is so much uncertainty for me i have to feel like my like my family is safe that's like number one i that's like my foundation is feeling like um for me like I, i've tried to have an understanding of what regardless of like a lot of what feels like noise just looking at information and what feels like a safe approach in terms of myself and my family and that's that's my first priority and then if that feels like it's in a stable, cool situation, then I, 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 I mean, I read a lot, you know, I, I, I try and, and check out like what a lot of um, epidemiologists and virologists are saying about what the situation is. And, and, and I, I also think that being comfortable with the unknown is really important too. It's like probably more than anything, this whole situation is defined by things that are unknown. And if, if, you can be cool with that. It, it seems really helpful. Then you can kind of decide whatever your relationship with risk 
within something that's unknown is. But it, it seems like a lot of problems come when um, if you're uncomfortable with not knowing and then you, you feel compelled to assert knowing something that's impossible to know and then you disagree with somebody else that is also asserting that they know something else that's impossible to know, it's, it's, a, it's a stalemate. There's and a lot of room for pissed. interpersonal conflict here, yeah, based on. Yeah, yeah, totally. Not knowing. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> I'm, I'm much more interested. That, there's a lot of things I don't know, and this is one of them, you know. So just, you know, in, in closing, before you uh, sign off and tell us how to reach you and get your albums, mm -hmm. uh, being a father, being around the protests, any education for your daughter, even if not now going forward, how you, uh, you know, continue to make her aware of, uh, you know, diversity and sensitivity, uh, especially mm -hmm. being a musician who's studied many of the greats, uh, mm -hmm. you know, jazz musicians who have been uh, from black culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, as you can see, we have a Black Lives Matter poster hanging out. I'm, I'm sitting on our front porch. Um, I, f I felt very happy yesterday when uh, we celebrated Father's Day and towards the end of the day, my wife said something to my daughter, Ida. She said like, you know, it's Father's Day. It's a special day for daddy. And Ida's response was, well, yeah, but it's not nearly as special as Juneteenth, right? <laughs> Which was... <laughs> Wow. It's like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. That's true. Friday um, night, my daughter was playing. We were watching a documentary at her direction. Oh, yeah. And, and my homework has been to pick up a book called uh, Survival Math. So if you have any suggested uh, readings or um, educational materials, please throw them to our listeners as well. But that's incredible. Yeah, I mean... I, you know, that, that, my, I guess as a father, my interest in, is in trying to cultivate a balance between, and it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a it's tricky, is like the idea that we're all humans, we're all part of nature, period. But then at the same time, trying to help her create an intellectual understanding that because of history, that has not been the case in terms of how people have been treated. And so it's our job to try and do whatever we can do to balance that equation. Because it, it seems naive to just come from the standpoint of like, we're all beautiful, we're all humans, period. That's not the full story. It's like, yes, of course, that's true. I completely believe that. But so many people in history have not thought that and their lack of thinking that has created actual events and such intense oppression that it seems like being aware of that even as a child is very very important and, when, and like when i think back to being a child and think back to how um i was taught about race there are so many issues that i have with so many things that i think were were wrong in in how things were portrayed and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do my best to, to be a responsible parent about that. And it's hard. It's impossible to do it perfectly. I'm just trying. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah, that, that's all we can do. And uh, my, my daughter's a little older than yours, but certainly with social media, they're getting information before I even get it. <laughs> so <laughs> before I even know what's happening, I have a protest in my house. So <laughs> my whole job imagine. is about how to like direct socially distant and safe protests i guess mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah yeah totally yeah no, well jason i think we could do you know one of these every month and we'd never get bored of what to talk about <laughs> <laughs> i agree it's really fun to talk thanks for having me I, yeah thank you and i know we're just scratching the cervix on your music career uh, if you don't mind uh we're going to put all your contact in the show notes but please share with people how to get a hold of you and how to get your records should they be interested while they're at home in expanding their jazz palette yeah absolutely my, my website is jasonsteinmusic.com it's my full name music.com all all my records are on there um you can just look me up on YouTube. There's a bunch of videos of me playing. And then if you like something, you can easily search my name with a band name. Uh, if you just search my name, you'll, you'll see my records. I have a lot of them and they're, they're all for sale. 
It's beautiful. It's it's a real you know pleasure to see you. Uh, as sad as I was to see you leave basketball, uh, to see the full journey and scope of life after sports and how your passion from one element of life can always be parlayed into uh, skills and commitment that help you thrive um, through the long haul. So uh, I think that I hope Jason is an inspiration, all of you for following your gut and your passion, despite what anybody says, let it be your principal or your parent at times and, and following your own creative instincts to produce what you're meant to be, like Jason says, to follow your calling. I agree. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, that was a real honor having Jason Stein, a musician and a former basketball player uh, and friend from my childhood on the show. I hope you will check out his Jason, his music, Jason Stein Music, uh, and pick up an album. And thanks again to our sponsor, Impact Dental Designs. If you are needing protective mouth gear for your soccer, football, boxing, or MMA fight, check them out on Instagram. And again, I'm Richard Listens. Reach me on Instagram at Richard Listens or support the show, patreon.com slash Richard Listens. Thank you again. I love all the high performers coming from various realms of sport, entertainment, and life. I look forward to bringing you more. I'm Richard Listens, and I'm out.